have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride, with one glance from your I'm at Walsingham in Norfolk on the east coast of England, a few miles inland from the North Sea. And this is the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. People have been coming here on pilgrimage for nearly a thousand years and the tradition is that you walk the last mile, the holy mile, barefoot, so I'm carrying my shoes. The story of Walsingham goes right back to 1061, that's a few years before the Norman conquest of England in 1066. The lady of the manor here, Richeldis, had a vision of Our Lady who asked her to rebuild a complete replica of the Holy House of Nazareth here at Walsingham in England. And Walsingham went on to become one of the four great shrines of Christendom. There was Jerusalem, of course, but that was in Muslim hands for many years and in inaccessible to ordinary pilgrims. So there were four. There was St. Peter's in Rome. There was Santiago de Compostela at the ends of the earth in Spain. There was Monte Gargano in Italy, where the Archangel Michael appeared in a cave. And there was Walsingham, England's Nazareth. This is above all a place of prayer, and that's what I've come to do, here at the Slipper Chapel, barefoot. Coming here to pray is what Walsingham is all about. But to discover the history of this extraordinary shrine, we've got to go back into the little town of Walsingham and discover a thousand years of history, royal history, pilgrim history. So come with me back into the village and we'll learn about just how it all began in Walsingham. The story of the Walsingham Shrine begins just down the way here, at the manor house of the de Favash family. At the time we meet the family, Richeldis, a Saxon lady married to a Norman, is a widow with a great devotion to Our Lady. And in a dream, Our Lady appears to her and asks her to build an exact reconstruction of the little house at Nazareth. And Richeldis did this on land that was to become famous across Europe. The house seems very small and was built to Our Lady's exact specifications. 
Around it grew up a priory, Augustinian priors, and this became a great centre of pilgrimage. People came here from all over England, and the monarchs of England came too. There are records of Henry III and Henry VII coming here. And as a result, Walsingham became a very prosperous little town. Uh, with a shrine, there comes the need for places to stay, inns, shops. And people would make the lengthy journey here and then stay for several days. Norfolk was very prosperous, the centre of the wool trade, with many wonderful noble parish churches. This was a centre of great devotion across England and across Europe. The last king to come here was Henry VIII, the son of Henry VII, the Tudor monarch. King Henry VIII began the last lap of his pilgrimage to Walsingham here at East Barsham Manor, today a preserved Tudor manor house here in the Norfolk countryside. Henry began the last lap in style, barefoot. The year was January 1511, and he had come to Walsingham quite quickly from London, where Queen Catherine, his Spanish wife, had just given birth to a little boy, Prince Henry. Tragically, the boy was not to live, but Henry, his father, didn't know that when he came here very quickly to Walsingham to give thanks to Our Lady of Walsingham for this gift of a son. Henry wasn't alone. Queen Catherine was still in London, recovering from the birth of her baby. And Henry travelled here, however, with the whole court. A king travelled in style. This manor house would have seen much merriment as the royal party gathered for an evening meal and to stay. spend a week in Walsingham, all told. When he began this last lap of the walk, we're about two or three miles from the shrine here at, here at East Barsham, he walked barefoot in the snow, the January snow. In a way, the site of this pilgrimage was almost like a summary of all the great medieval pilgrimages. People were wearing their finest clothes to honour Our Lady, and they were with the King, but they were barefoot and they were praying as they walked. A pilgrimage like this would have been a fine sight to see, the king with all his court paying tribute to Mary, who was, in a very important sense, their queen. Henry VIII had a deep devotion to Our Lady of Walsingham, and we can see this from the Walsingham's own accounts. They're still there. He paid at one point 42 shillings for a priest to pray, well, actually to sing prayers on behalf of the king in front of the image of Our Lady of Walsingham. And there were also other sums of money paid regularly in order that candles should burn before the image of Our Lady of Walsingham on the king's behalf. The irony about the life of Henry VIII is that he always considered himself a Catholic. He went to Mass, a Latin Mass, every morning of his life, right up to the end, and he couldn't imagine being anything other than a Roman Catholic. There was no other way of being a Christian. There's no evidence at all that he intended to found an independent new denomination. Henry simply wanted to be a Catholic on his own terms. He wanted to do it in defiance of the moral law as taught in the scriptures. Henry wanted to abandon his wife because she wouldn't provide him with the heir that he thought was his right and marry his mistress, who was already pregnant, when he married her. And Henry was prepared to do that in defiance of the church 
which had taught and nurtured the only faith that he and all his ancestors had ever known. Henry had regarded himself as a very loyal Catholic. He wrote a defence of the church and her seven sacraments as an answer to the claims being made by Martin Luther, who claimed that there were only two sacraments and had denounced the other five. And for this defence, he was given by the Pope the title Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith, a title borne by every British monarch since that time. That's why the initials FD follow on after our sovereign's name on all our coinage. But Henry didn't defend the faith. He defied the church, married his mistress and broke with Rome. The end result was not only the destruction of all the shrines and monasteries in our country, but the splitting of Christianity in England and the destruction of England's ancient faith. So that even 400 years after his death, the tragedy of what he did still lingers and still causes sorrow to Christians and damage to the cause of Christ and the evangelization of our nation. Our Lady of Walsingham, she was so important to Henry, her image was burned along with all the other images of Our Lady, Our Lady of Ipswich, Our Lady of Caversham, at Chelsea, on the banks of the Thames, in a great bonfire. And somehow, the joys and sorrows of the King's early life, when he was idealistic, when he was defending the faith, when he was praying for an heir, were all destroyed too. And by then, Henry had long abandoned Catherine and was on to the beginning of a career that would give him six wives. Henry had loved Our Lady of Walsingham, but in the end he didn't remain true to her, and the bright promise of that barefoot pilgrimage at the beginning of his reign was not fulfilled. What happened to Queen Catherine, Catherine of Aragon? Henry arranged for her to be sent away, and she was effectively exiled to Buckton Towers in Cambridgeshire. She was much loved by the local people there. So although she was lonely at heart, she did find plenty to do. She cared for the poor and she had people who lived with her and looked after her. But she was always unhappy. In her will, she left a message for the king in which she said, Lastly, mine eyes desire yours above all things. She left money in her will, not only for the local poor and for the maids and the people who'd looked after her, but also for the shrine. She left money for candles to burn at the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. Henry destroyed the shrines across England and all the monastic houses. And in the reign of Elizabeth I, Catholicism was outlawed. Everything was destroyed and there was to be nothing left at Walsingham for nearly 400 years. One man who was imprisoned because of his Catholic faith belonged to the family of the Dukes of Norfolk, Philip Howard, imprisoned in the Tower of London. And he wrote a poem about Walsingham's desolation. In the racks of Walsingham, whom should I choose but the Queen of Walsingham to be guide to my muse? Then thou, Prince of Walsingham, grant me to frame bitter plaints to rue thy wrong. 
bitter woe for thy name. People did actually come here secretly, though. There's a rather sad story about an old lady who told people that she'd prayed to Our Lady of Walsingham and received answers to her prayer. And she was arrested and made to march around the village square with a big placard saying, I'm a liar, and was then put in the stocks, probably just back there by the village pump. And Walsingham as a shrine was no more. Absolute silence for 400 years. I'm in the Pilgrim Hostel in Friday Market in the heart of Walsingham village. And this is the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham that pilgrims from here will be carrying up the Holy Mile to the shrine, the Slipper Chapel Shrine. We would actually don't know quite what the original statue of Our Lady of Walsingham looked like. It was burned. But we can reconstruct it from seals that were made. It's quite interesting. Mary is depicted as a queen and she's wearing a simple Saxon crown, rather different from the much more elaborate crowns that monarchs of later centuries were to wear and different from the crown worn by Queen Elizabeth II today, which is an imperial crown studded with diamonds and jewels. Mary's seated on a throne, not a wooden working bench, but very much a throne with bands across it. It's very incarnational. She has the Christ child, our saviour, on her lap and she's showing him to us. And it is significant that at Walsingham Mary appeared to the lady of the manor, not to a little peasant girl. This is very much feudal medieval England. This is not the 20th or the 19th centuries. It's very different from Lourdes or Fatima. Mary has a serenity in her face and a certain sense of command. At Walsingham, Mary lays claim to her throne. This is Mary claiming her diary of England. This is Mary saying, this land of England is mine and here I will reign with gentleness and with prayer. The care of the Holy House at Walsingham was given over to the Augustinian canons who built here a great and magnificent priory, not only to shelter the Holy House, not only just to welcome pilgrims, but to be the heart of a whole way of life that grew up around all of this. They would farm the land, care for pilgrims, care for the poor, welcome the king and his court on pilgrimage to Walsingham. And so many people came here that the Milky Way in the sky, the constellation of stars, was renamed the Walsingham Way because it represented, it seemed, all the thousands of people that made their way across the Norfolk landscape over the fields and hills to get here to Walsingham. And the King too came here and was entertained by the friars at Walsingham. We have a description of Candlemas Day in the late 13th century being celebrated here by the king and all his court. What was the priory like? Huge, really huge. The broken arch behind me is the one fragment now remaining. This was on an enormous scale. The friars farmed the land, welcomed pilgrims, cared for the poor. And around here was not only a great church, accommodation for all the friars, but all the other ancillary buildings. All this came to an end in the reign of Henry VIII. He needed money and he closed down, effectively privatised, all the monastic houses of England, seizing the money for himself. Perhaps nationalised would be a better word. The money went to him, the land went to his favourites. When Henry VIII ransacked the priories and abbeys of England, Walsingham made a big mistake. 
Unlike the monks of the London Charter House, who were martyred for standing firm, Walsingham submitted to the king, allowing the priory to become, in effect, his property. It didn't do them any good. They simply had everything taken away anyway. And so Walsingham, even though they decided to go along with the king, found they couldn't curry favour. The king's men arrived, stripped everything. The monks were pensioned off or simply sent away. The treasures were dispersed, burned, destroyed. And Walsingham was handed over to a private family. By now, everything would have been in ruins. The lead was stripped from the roofs. The buildings fell into disrepair and people used the fabric for their own cottages. The sturdy outer walls of the property were so secure that they went on providing shelter for people. And embedded in the walls, for instance, here in Walsingham, is the courthouse in use throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, still open to the public to view today. And in that room, men were sentenced, for example, to transportation in Australia. A lot of tragedy went on there. The actual ruined buildings, however, were incorporated into the stately home that was then built on this site. And generations of well-to-do people lived here and enjoyed the fact that they had ruins in their garden. It's described rather well in Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, the well-to-do family living in a gracious house with the added interest of a ruined abbey around their grounds. What we see here as ruins, a centre for devotion and prayer where visitors are warmly welcomed, was for centuries something that was a scene of dereliction. What happened to the Holy House itself? Well, we're just going to go and look at that. The Holy House was here at an angle adjoining the great nave of the Priory. Originally it was a wooden building, but over the centuries it became encased in a stone one, forming a chapel. Erasmus visited here in its heyday, shortly before its tragic disillusion. Erasmus was a friend of Thomas More, and he describes the Holy House. People went in as a sort of chapel. In 1961, some excavations were done here in order that we would find the exact spot of the Holy House. And they discovered the evidence that it was exactly where I'm standing. Part of the evidence was that in medieval times, a prominent man who was a Knight of the Garter had asked in his will that he be buried at the Holy House. And when they did the digging, they found his grave, including the remnants of the insignia of the Knight of the Garter. The destruction of the Holy House meant the destruction of something so much larger than just one little chapel. This had been the holiest place in all Walsingham, and its destruction would have shattered everyone. But what King Henry VIII did too was to close down all the monasteries and abbeys of England. This meant poverty on a massive scale. Here at Walsingham, the shopkeepers, the innkeepers, everyone who had made a livelihood by pilgrims coming suddenly faced destitution. And more, there was no one to help them when they grew sick or ill. There was nothing anymore once the great network of abbeys and monasteries had gone. Devastation, poverty and great unrest. The poor wanted to be up in arms, but they couldn't be. 
the penalty for doing anything that would oppose the king was death, probably by hanging, drawing and quartering. This was a time of real horror, a time of terrible poverty, a time of uncertainty, a time of deep civil unrest resting on fear of the whole future. The whole network of help for the poor had gone and a whole way of life had been crushed and abolished. It's said that when Henry VIII lay dying, his last words were, all is lost, kingdom, soul, life. Monks, monks, monks. After the destruction of the shrine under Henry VIII and the crushing of Catholicism and all things Catholic under Queen Elizabeth I, a great silence descended on the subject of Our Lady at Walsingham. The shrine and everything associated with it had been completely destroyed and Walsingham became once again just a little obscure village, a place that had once been a great shrine of Christendom now had no Catholics living there at all, and none even in the vicinity, none really in the whole of Norfolk. And of Our Lady, there was nothing. And it stayed that way throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. At the beginning of the 20th century, 400 odd years after the crushing of the shrine, the local Anglican vicar, the Reverend Hope Patton, who was vicar of St Mary's, a pre-Reformation church built by Catholic hands for Catholic worship, revived the idea of Our Lady. He had a personal devotion to Mary and he conceived the idea of restoring the shrine. The result is what you see about me here. This is the revived Anglican shrine of the Holy House, Our Lady of Walsingham.
Reverend Philip North is the priest administrator of this shrine and has inherited the tradition established by Hope Patton all those years ago, something which was grown to an enormous scale. Tell me, it began in the 1920s with this revival, this extraordinary revival of the tradition of the Holy House. Yes, Father Hope Patton came to be vicar of Walsingham in 1921, and he was a man with a, a, an immense love of Our Lady, a, a fascination with the pilgrimage, a fascination with particularly the medieval history of Walsingham. And from the start, he had a vision to restore pilgrimage and to make pilgrimage part of Anglican devotional practice. And so in 1922, he had a new image of Our Lady of Walsingham carved and set up initially in the parish church, in St Mary's Church. And then very quietly through the 20s, pilgrimage began again here. And then in the 30s, it really became very large. We've uh, seen posters and photographs and so on. And now it's really become part of almost a certain mainstream Anglicanism, hasn't it? Well, I, th I think, it, it, ironically, a great help in that was the Bishop of Norwich in 1931, who didn't like this great big image of Our Lady in one of his parish churches and ordered Hope Patton to remove it. And Hope Patton responded by building a new holy house, which is just next to where, where we're seated now. Now encased in a, in a beautiful shrine church built in, in, in uh, slightly later than the Holy House, and so there's a separate shrine church with its own grounds, its own accommodation, and and you know we just find each year more and more people from a wider and wider range of backgrounds finding something um, special here in this holy ground and finding a wonderful example of Christian living in Our Lady. And you have a very good, very friendly relationship with the Catholic shrine, the Slipper Chapel Shrine. That's right, we warm, friendly relations. We get on very well with the staff there. We work closely together, we enjoy each other's company, and we go to big events and, and pray together at key times of the year, particularly the Assumption and, and uh, the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. And when pilgrims come here, what would they typically do? What would be the form of an Anglican pilgrimage of people who'd come here by coach? I th the first thing perhaps to say is that all Anglicans here will also go and pray at the Slipper Chapel. That's another important ecumenical dimension. Mm. But when they come here, they'll join in with a pilgrimage programme. We can accommodate up to about 200, 250 people. And so they'll join in with a programme of worship, which will, of course, centre on the Eucharist. We'll also include sprinkling with water at the well. It will include a pr an outdoor procession of Our Lady, perhaps mm. a procession of the Host and Benediction, Stations of the Cross. Um, so there'll be a programme of devotions that they'll join in with while they're here, as well as enjoying being in the village, and enjoying in the countryside and enjoying one another's company. And if Hope Patton were to come back, do you think he'd be pleased with what he sees here? I think he'd be astonished. One of his great fears was that the pilgrimage would just die out after he died. And what's happened is that it's grown and grown and grown. So I think when he saw the scale of the place, the size of the place, the number of people coming, especially the number of young people coming, I think he'd be thrilled. And what about the Lady Richeldis? How do you think you would talk to her? I think she would weep that we need to have two shrines in this one holy ground. Um, I think that will cause a great sadness, as it causes us all great sadness. And of course we pray every day for the day when there need only be one shrine in Walsingham. A feature of the Shrine of Walsingham were two holy wells. The water was said to have healing properties and this is a very strong tradition at Marian shrines. And these were situated just behind the great nave, the last fragment of which the great arch still stands in front of me as I'm speaking. The association between Mary and water of healing is very strong. Think of Lourdes today. And in our faith, the whole tradition of water washing away our sins at baptism, Christ speaking to the woman at the well and talking about water. 
And think of the pilgrims who down all the centuries have brought home holy water with its healing properties, a symbol of Christ's healing still being amongst us. Today's pilgrims to the Slipper Chapel Shrine can also have holy water and there's an open air font there and people fill bottles and take home water, holy water, home from the Shrine of Walsingham. Now look at this. This is the Walsingham Methodist Church. But look at the notice, Holy Mass in progress. After the Reformation, there would have been a rather bleak time for Christians all over England. The Roman Catholic Church was completely banned in Elizabeth I's reign. What happened after that? Well, the Anglican Church existed and was the official church. But by the beginning of the 18th century, one of the things that happened in England was the preaching of John Wesley, founder, effectively, of the Methodist Church, who preached here in this Norfolk village. He electrified country districts, especially preaching to the poor, to small tradesmen, to labourers. And they clubbed together and built their own chapels in which they could praise God and experience something of his nearness that they'd begun to understand through the vibrant preaching of John Wesley. Here in Walsingham, this was the most vibrant form of Christianity. And the people of Walsingham built what was for those days a very large building. Out of their own funds as ordinary country people, they built this great Methodist church. And services were held here throughout the 19th century and it would have been here that people came to know God. Now, just recently in Walsingham, the Catholic parish church, the one serving the ordinary Catholic parishioners, not the shrine, has had to be rebuilt. It's too small for modern day needs and especially for the needs of visiting pilgrims. While it's been rebuilt, the Methodists kindly offered the use of their large church for mass. We're living in a very different era from the one in which Catholicism was banned. And this is the beautiful new church of the Annunciation dedicated on the Feast of the Annunciation by the local bishop. It's faced with local stone and makes a marvellous feature right here in the heart of Little Walsingham. It's joined on at one side to the Pilgrim House, so it makes a unity with all of that. And it incorporates a number of the features of the old church, including the cross that was on the roof of the old church, some beautiful things inside, including the Stations of the Cross and Statue of Our Lady, and here, from the wall of the old church, the crossed keys and papal tiara, the keys of the kingdom of heaven that Christ gave to St. Peter. It's got a thriving congregation, good numbers for weekday mass, and for regular adoration of the blessed sacrament. We're here in the cloister just outside the Slipper Chapel and I'm talking to Father Noel Wynne, who's the director of the shrine here. Father, you're a Marist uh, father, so does your order have care of the shrine here? We do. In 1968, Father Roland Connolly, one of our priests, had been working in vocations for quite a while and bringing young people here. And he was asked if he would look after the shrine 
Shortly after that, the English province was asked if we would take charge of it. And since then, we've always appointed a Maris priest as the director. And we have a community of priests helping here as well. And what sort of people come? They mostly seem to be quite large parish groups. I mean, you get great coach loads coming. Do you get individuals? And do you get anyone from abroad? One of the phenomenons of today is the huge number of people we, come, we get coming who are of Sri Lankan origin. The biggest single pilgrimage we have now is the Tamil pilgrimage, when about 4,000 people come on one day. And we have about 100 people uh, who are resident normally for two, three or four days. And then at weekends, larger day pilgrimages from dioceses or various religious communities. So it's a big thing. And something like the Tamil pilgrimage with 4,000 what about the new movements in the church? Have they found a, a home here at Walsingham? Yes, for quite a long time the, we've had a New Dawn conference every August. That's a charismatic uh, renewal movement within the Catholic Church. And they set up a tented city around here and mm -hmm. have three or four thousand people. They lay on their own speakers, but they do th certain things at the shrine as well. They're followed by Youth 2000, which is a, an English youth group. And uh, we also have close connections with the community of St. John, which is a new religious order started in France some years ago. And what about disabled people coming? Is there any tradition, and I'm really thinking also going way back to medieval times, is there a tradition of healing, physical healing here? Certainly right at the beginning, there are lots of stories of healing. Uh, the message of Walsingham has been that our Lady said to Richeldus, anybody who comes here seeking help uh, will not go away empty. Although it's perhaps not as upfront as some of the other shrines, uh, many people do find that they get healing here. And we hear occasional stories which can only be regarded as miraculous. Mm. And you really, you do feel, obviously, there's room for this shrine and its whole message in the, in the 21st century. I think perhaps more so than ever, the message of Walsingham is the message of the Incarnation. Mm. And uh, we tell people often that they come here to find Mary, through her to find her son, but they can't stay here all the time. They must go back to the world in which they live and bring Christ into that world as Mary did 2,000 years ago. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The beautiful statue here in the Slipper Chapel, it's got a new modern chapter to its story, hasn't it? Yes, it's a very nice story that. The when the Pope came to England in 1982, he would very much have liked to come to Walsingham, but it wasn't possible. And so when he said Mass in Wembley Stadium, uh, Our Lady went to see him. And uh, the director of the shrine, Father Birch, at that time, together with the administrator of the Anglican shrine, took the statue down. She did a lap of honor of Wembley, and then the Pope took hold of the statue, put it on the altar, and left it there all through Mass. And that's not the sort of thing you normally do just before Mass, putting a statue on the altar for Mass, is it? It isn't. It's not allowed. But if you're the Pope, you can do what you like. <laughs> And what would you feel that you could say if you met the Lady Richeldis and you told her what had happened, including that big break under Henry VIII and something revived? I'd probably ask her why she didn't uh, build it somewhere near a mainline railway station. <laughs>
The story of the Catholic shrine here at Walsingham is really the story of Charlotte Boyd. She grew up in the 19th century, a lady of a well-to-do family. And she'd always been interested in the old ruined abbeys and monasteries in England. She had some family money coming to her. And in 1897, she decided to acquire a little old disused chapel that she'd seen in the fields outside Walsingham. It wasn't a ruined abbey. It was the ruined slipper chapel, the chapel of St Catherine, belonging to the old shrine of Walsingham. The one bit that was left from the destroyed shrine and all the things that had once made Walsingham so famous. Because it was out in the fields, it had been simply abandoned, but it was sturdily built and it had been used as a barn and all sorts of things had been stored there over the centuries. Charlotte Boyd bought it and in the process of doing so was really walking a spiritual journey of her own. During the process of legally acquiring this chapel, she became a Catholic. And so what was planned as simply a little individual ordinary church became the genesis of a Catholic national shrine. But it didn't happen at once. This little chapel was cleaned up and opened for worship. But the Blessed Sacrament wasn't brought here. The local bishop didn't want it as a mass centre. There was no point. There were no Catholics living within miles of Walsingham. Instead, he decreed that the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, for Catholics, would be at King's Lynn, down on the coast, where there was already a Catholic presence and a church. And for some 20 or 30 years in the early part of the 20th century, pilgrimages went from London and elsewhere to King's Lynn, led by the Guild of Our Lady of Ransom. Eventually, however, just before the Second World War, a new bishop allowed the idea of a shrine here in these fields, part of Walsingham itself. And so the first mass was celebrated in the tiny, now renovated, Slipper Chapel. Then, four days later, a huge pilgrimage, 10,000 people from all over England, something that had been planned and organised for a long while, came by train and the National Catholic Shrine of Our Lady was established here at Walsingham. Charlotte Boyd is very much commemorated here. It was helped actually a few years later by American Catholic servicemen stationed nearby at the many airfields in this corner of England. They came here for Mass, and Mass was said publicly and openly at the Slipper Chapel Shrine. After the Second World War, by which time the shrine was moderately well established, young men carried 14 wooden crosses from different parts of England and established them here at the shrine to mark the 14 stations of the cross, praying for peace. The wooden crosses are still there, forming an outdoors way of the cross, and round it now is an open-air altar and a huge new Church of the Reconciliation, dedicated to reconciliation and understanding between man and God, between man and man, and perhaps especially too between Catholics and Anglicans in this corner of England. And now Catholics from all over England come regularly to Walsingham. This is a place of reconciliation, a place to go to confession, to open our hearts to God, to open our hearts to one another. Walsingham is what it was always originally planned to be. Walsingham is the home, the holy house. Walsingham is England's Nazareth again. It was in 1829 that freedom finally came to Catholics after all those years of oppression. 
and it was Catholic emancipation in that year that enabled the regrowth of the Catholic Church, so that people like Charlotte Boyd could freely make the decision to be Catholics and live in the Catholic faith. And it was two world wars, perhaps, that taught people the value of a real and lasting faith, a revival of older traditions. And then at the beginning of the 21st century, modern travel makes it possible for people once again to come to Walsingham. But this time in a new way, to experience pilgrimage afresh after long centuries when it was abandoned. Discover its meaning for a new century when we've got so much we need to pray about. There's something about Walsingham that makes you feel sort of the unchangeability of the Catholic faith and the way that Catholic traditions are renewed. Walking down the lanes here in Norfolk with the creamy white may blossom on the hedgerows and the white Queen Anne's lace that line all the lanes here, you can find echoes of Catholicism everywhere, in the names of flowers, in the way we look at things, and in celebrating Mary in the month of May. It's impossible not to feel very close to the beauty of God's creation and to understand somehow that we're walking with him through the journey of our life and that there's a Nazareth to which we're all waiting. I think that going home to Nazareth is really the message of Walsingham. How beautiful you are, my darling, my bride. How beautiful you are, the doves of your eyes and your lips of scarlet ribbon and your lips of scarlet ribbon. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance from your eyes and one jewel from your necklace and one jewel. from the south Come low upon my garden Wake north wind Wind from the south Come low upon my garden Then my fragrance may spread abroad and my love come, come blow upon my garden. That my fragrance may spread abroad, and my love may come and taste the joy.
choice fruits of my garden You have stolen my heart My sister, my bride With one glance from your eyes And one jewel from your 